Subversion is the term, if, if you look in a, in a dictionary or criminal code to that matter, usually is, ex is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government system, political, eco economical system of a country. And usually it's linked to espionage and such romantic things as blowing up bridges, sidetracking trains, um, clock and dagger activity in Hollywood style. Uh, when what I'm going to talk about now has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché of espionage or KGB activity of collecting information. So the greatest mistake or mis mis misconception, I think, is that uh, whenever we are talking about KGB for some strange reason, uh, starting from Hollywood movie makers to professors of political science and quote-unquote experts on, on Soviet affairs or Kremlinologists as they call themselves, they think that the most desirable thing for Andropov and the whole KGB is to steal blueprints of some supersonic jet, bring it back to Soviet Union and sell it to the Soviet military-industrial complex. It's only partly true. If, if, if we take <clears throat> the whole time, money, and manpower that the Soviet Union and KGB in particular spends outside of USSR border, we will discover, of course there are no official statistics unlike with CIA or FBI, that the espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent of the activity of KGB. The rest, 85 percent, is always subversion. And unlike a dictionary of English, Oxford Dictionary, subversion in Soviet terminology means always a destructive, aggressive activity aimed to destroy the country, nation, or geographical area of your enemy. So there's no romantics in there, absolutely. No blowing up bridges, no microfilms in Coca-Cola cans, nothing of that sort. <laughs> no James Bond nonsense. It's most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat, an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself was 10 years ago. Now, subversion <clears throat> is an activity which is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. If you know history of Japan, for example, before the 20th century, Japan was a closed society. The moment a foreign boat comes to the shores of Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army politely tell them to get lost. <laughs> and if American salesman comes to the shore of Japan, let's say 60 or 70 years from now back, and says, oh, I have a very beautiful vacuum cleaner for you, you know, with the good financing, he says, please leave us, we don't need your vacuum cleaner. If they don't leave, they shoot them to preserve their culture, ideology, traditions, Values intact. You were not able to subvert Japan. You cannot subvert Soviet Union because the borders are closed. The media is censored by the government. The population is controlled by the KGB and internal police. With all the beautiful glossy pictures of Time magazine and Magazine America, which is published by by the uh, American Embassy in Moscow. You cannot subvert Soviet citizens because the magazine never reaches Soviet citizens. 
It's collected from the new stands and thrown to garbage can. Subversion can be only successful when the initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. There is no response similar to that one from United States to the Soviet Union. It stops halfway somewhere. It never reaches here. The theory of subversion goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. to 2,500 years B.C. He was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China. And he said, after long meditation, that to implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy, and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least feasible. Better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired, if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. As you see, not the single mentioning of blowing up bridges. Of course, Sun Tzu did know about blowing up bridges. Maybe there were not that many bridges at that time. <laughs> but the basics of subversion is being taught to every student of KGB school in USSR and to officers of, of military academies. I'm not sure if the same author is included in the list of reading for American officers to say nothing about ordinary students of political science. I had difficulty to find the translation of Sun Tzu in, in the library of of a university in Toronto and later on here in, in Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a book which is not available. It is forced to every student in the USSR. Every student who is, who is taught to be dealing further in, in, in his future career with foreigners. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here, and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why? by 15 or 20 years. This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually, it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing, or by various methods, infiltration, uh, 
propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped, religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy, okay? Five areas. Uh, I will not write them down because we will not have enough space. Some, sometimes when I describe all the methods, uh, students ask me question, are you sure this is the result of the Soviet influence? Not necessarily. You see, the tactic of subversion about which I'm talking is similar to the martial art, the Japanese martial art. If, you're, if some of you are familiar with that tactic, probably you will remember that if an enemy is bigger and heavier than yourself, it would be very painful to resist his direct strike. If a heavier person wants to strike me in the face, it would be very naive and counterproductive to stop his blow. The Chinese and Japanese judo art tells us what to do. First to avoid the strike, then to grab the fist and continue his movement in the direction where it was before, right? Until the enemy crashes in the wall. You see? So, what happens here? The target country obviously does something wrong. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy, conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything. Right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited. Right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, Right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis. Right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? So, on the stage of demoralization, obviously, there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything, as long as it takes you away, okay, 
social life, replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals, and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Okay. Away from the natural links. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, face, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, president and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you are better or worse, doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army, looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug, but basically he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. No? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> nice fellow. <laughs> Erosion. <laughs> a slow substitution of basic moral principles, whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. There is still a doubt 
to kill or not to kill, to be or not to be. Thy shall not kill, yes. But this uh, line may not necessarily be applicable to a murderer. Thy shall not murder. That should be the, the, the presumption, not, not that thy shall not kill. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me, and you give me your five pairs of shoes, and I will distribute it accordingly. So the, the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death, death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously, uh, still workers, say, 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer. Now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving a, wor a, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets. Murders, shooting truck drivers by picketers. In Montreal, for example, I saw with my own eyes when I was correspondent of CBC International, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when the workers of aircraft factory destroyed computers and, and, and the equipment in the factory. And they, the, the administration employed strike breakers. Their cars were turned upside down and burned. Their houses were burned, their kids were intimidated, and some victims were there. Of that we can be sure. Why? To improve conditions of worker? No. Ideology. Okay, so this is what happens, basically. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union. But the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers' right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. Whose rights? Workers? No. The, the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? By trade union boss. Unlimited power is given, responsibility. I want to sell my labor not for two fifty an hour, but for two dollars. I don't have right. My freedom is denied to me. I know that if I sell my work for two dollars an hour, not for three dollars an hour, 
I will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy. I don't need two, three dollars. I need only two dollars. No, I was made to believe by media, by business, by advertising agencies that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. <laughs> no way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, you have to buy it. And hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, you hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a pantyhose sale. <laughs> save by buying more. <laughs> of course, of course. It, it would be too naive to expect that KGB makes that advertising agency to, to do such a crazy commercial. No, of course not. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious groups with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninism propaganda, then a propaganda of of the legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality, equality, mind you. President Kennedy once said, people, we will make America to believe that people are born equal. Are people born equal? Is there any mentioning in the Bible or any other holy scripture in any religion, any religion, if you don't believe me, go to the library and check it. There is not a single word about equality. Just the opposite. By your deeds, God will judge you. What you do is important. The merit of your personality. You cannot legislate equality if you want to be equal. You have to be equal. You have to deserve it. And yet we build our society on the principle of equality. We say people are equal. We know it is false. It's a lie. Some people are tall and stupid. Others are short, bold, and clever. <laughs> if we make them... <laughs> if we make them equal by force... <laughs> If we put the principle of equality in the basis of our social political structure, it's the same thing as building a house on sand. Sooner or later, it will collapse. And that's exactly what happens. And we, as Soviet propaganda makers, are trying to push you in the direction which you go yourself. Equality. Yes, equality. People are equal. Land of equal opportunities. Is it true or not? Think about it. Equal opportunities. Should there be equal opportunities? For me and for a lazy bastard who comes here from some other country and immediately registers as, as a welfare uh, recipient benefits. I never received a single... Do no, sorry, I did receive once. But I never applied for welfare. For the 13 years, I took any job. Security guard, journalist taxi driver, anything. Well, I was restless, but some people don't like it. They immediately... So why should we be... E why should we have equal opportunities? Why? The equal opportunity to excel. Equal opportunity in equal circumstances, yes, but we know people are different. To excel, yes, provided we reach the same level of excellency, perfection, which is hypothetical distant future. Yes, maybe. But we know perfectly well that even with the best intentions, people could not be equal. Why should we have equality in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, say, legal system? Myself, I'm, I'm considering myself a law-abiding citizen, and a person who comes here to rob and shoot, say, uh, the United States administration under Carter imported thousands of Cuban criminals. They were non-criminals, yet they were accepted. Do you think it's fair if myself and my wife from Philippines who work like uh, 
excuse me, horse, uh, as a lab technician in, in the hospital, should have the same rights as a criminal from, from Cuba? Why? And yet we repeat as parents, equality, equality, equality. And the Soviet propaganda system helps us to believe that equality is something which is desirable. Democracy, as it was established by fathers of this country, of, of this system, in the last century, is, is not equality. It's the system where different people, unequal people, have a chance to survive and help each other in constant competition, in constant perfection. Not in equality, which is superimposed from, from a, a, a godfather or a nice person in Washington, D.C. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union, quote-unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt, except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, where there is no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in the countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia, and we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism, that is my former colleague from 